So I'm working on a 5,000 PSI pressure washer here. It's got a Power Fist 420cc engine. And the fella comes to me and just says, you know, I'm spraying carb cleaner into it. It's not firing. So I said, well, it's either spark, compression, or timing. So I pulled the plug, and I'm going to show you what the plug looked like. So here's his spark plug. It's an LG F7 RTC. These are garbage spark plugs, guys. They're torch. But check this out. I want to show you. See that? That gap is too big. And I'm going to show you what that measures at. So right here I have a spark plug gap tool. And you use this to not only measure the gap, but set it. Now normally you run a plug like this at around 30 thousandths of an inch. So that's 0 0.030 of an inch. You can see that this plug is about 55 thousandths of an inch. That's way too big. Now I'm going to be replacing that plug with a BPR6ES plug. So this gap has been set to 28 thousandths of an inch and that's exactly what the manufacturer recommends for this particular machine. Just to have a little backstory here, he said that he bought this new two years ago and he's only used it for about an hour so it sat the rest of the time. He said that when he went to start it with a starter it wouldn't turn over. So he went to pull it and the recoil was seized. So he says he removed the recoil and took a breaker bar to the engine. So I said that his piston might have been a little seized up because when I asked him how he stored it, he says he just put it away in his garage. What you're supposed to do is remove the plug and spray some, it's called engine fogging. And then you just pull your engine over once by hand and that just lubricates everything. Because on a lot of these newer engines, guys, the engine block itself is aluminum, but the sleeve, the cylinder sleeve inside, that's what your piston rides up and down on. That's gonna be steel. Now your piston itself is gonna be aluminum, but the piston rings that make the seal in between the piston and the cylinder walls, the rings are gonna be steel as well. And those steel rings will actually seize themselves to the steel sleeve that's inside of your cylinder. What does that mean? Well, it could have damaged something, but I think that the first thing I saw when I pulled that plug was the gap being wrong. So I'm gonna use the electric starter here and we're gonna turn it over and we're gonna see if it has spark. And the spark plug is out right now, so that allows the engine to turn over much easier because it won't be building compression. Now I'm using a spark tester that is known as an air gap type. So I can actually thread this out to increase the gap, or I could thread it in to decrease the gap. And the farther the spark jumps from one side of the terminal to the other, means the more voltage you have. <laughs> Which it is, that's a huge gap. So I think what I'm gonna do guys is put my BPR6ES plug in and we're gonna see if we can fire this engine up. Okay, so new spark plugs in, we're gonna see what happens here. It may still need a carb clean because it sat for, you know, two years, but we're gonna just see. So it sounds like it's trying. So what I'm gonna do is spray some carburetor cleaner in there and we're gonna try it again. Okay, got some carb cleaner in there. Let's see. So nothing, which that worries me because by putting carburetor cleaner directly past the carburetor into the cylinder, you're doing the job of the carburetor, which is to put a fuel source into the engine. So essentially, by bypassing the carburetor, if that doesn't work, that means that you either have no spark, no compression, or bad timing. We've ruled out spark because we have spark, and it's strong spark. I think there's compression, but I can still do a compression check just to see. But I think this is a case of improper timing. So it's quite possible that when he went to unseize the engine using the brute force method, he may have sheared the flywheel key. So on the flywheel, there's gonna be a magnet, and as that magnet passes your coil, it creates spark. Now the position of that flywheel, and thus the position of the magnet, is what sets the timing. So that's what sets the time of the spark going to your spark plug there. So basically, with a sheared flywheel key, your flywheel shifts slightly and it produces spark at the wrong time. So instead of your piston being at top dead center or just before top dead center, your piston could be on the intake stroke and it's sparking with the valves open and you know. So I'm gonna pull the recoil probably and see if I can see the flywheel key. Another thing I should point out is that I absolutely hate these stamped metal covers that they put over the high tension lead or the spark plug cap. Because what ends up happening, and I've seen it before, is when you go to clip this onto your spark plug, uh, this metal cover over here pushes ever so slightly against the spark plug and it creates a gap in between your high tension lead up here and the top 
of your spark plug right there. So what will happen is when you use the spark tester, because it's got this long point on it, it goes farther in and makes a good connection. So you'll go to test spark and it'll have spark and then you'll go to pop that back onto your spark plug and it won't. So sometimes what I would recommend at that point is just pull your spark plug out, pop your spark plug in here and then ground your spark plug onto a source of ground or your frame and just see if it has spark that way. And that's a good quick check because like I said, you can just pull these off. They just wrap these little tabs over and you can just rip that off and that's just a heat shield that's all that is but i've never really seen it affect spark too much unless you're running this thing all day who knows but uh yeah so that's just something to think about so it may be difficult to see but we're gonna test so there is spark at the spark plug so we know that it's not a spark plug cap that's causing the issue so i have the cover I guess you can call it off of the side of the machine. It was just a bunch of eight millimeter bolts. And then I'll take the flywheel nut off and take this little housing here off. And then I'll check to see if the flywheel key is sheared. Okay, so I got the flywheel nut off and I'm just getting ready to pull the flywheel because it's hard to see the key when they don't have the slot or the keyway on the crankshaft machined all the way through. So this could be like a woodruff key where the key is slightly up farther on the shaft and it is a tapered shaft, so that's just a press fit flywheel. But if we look at where the starter gear teeth are, they're actually behind the coil. So what I'm gonna do is uh, remove this coil and I'll check the armature air gap when I go to reinstall it, but I'm gonna remove that completely. And then I'm gonna go ahead and use my pneumatic air hammer right there. And then we're just going to go inside of this little countersink that they've put in here and we're just gonna give it a little bit of shock and it should break that free because again, that is a tapered fit. So by using the pneumatic air hammer, all you're doing is putting vibration through the crankshaft, which normally breaks the flywheel free. And after doing that for a little while, you should get it to the point where the flywheel is free. Check that out, guys. See that? Sweet. Okay, so I got the flywheel off now and the woodruff key we can see is right there. The key is not sheared. So I did a video unseizing a Kohler engine. It was an SV540 and basically what we did is we took the spark plug out and we put in ATF, which is automatic transmission fluid. And what that does is it goes in and it bypasses your rings and it breaks up all the nasty stuff. Now you're gonna have a whole bunch of gunk inside your cylinder walls because it's literally gonna strip all that rust away. Then once it's wet and lubricated, then you go and use a breaker bar and you slowly turn the engine over and work that in. Uh, and then in that video, I went ahead and just did a light home on the cylinder walls and that just took a little bit of rust off so at this point what I'm gonna do is most likely pull the spark plug and get the piston to bottom dead center and I'm gonna probe the cylinder with my USB endoscope you guys can check that video out I did a little product review on it and I just went ahead and pulled the valve cover off just to see if the push rods are working so we're gonna spin the flywheel here and you can see we're on the exhaust stroke and then here's the intake stroke because there's the carburetor. Coming up to the compression stroke, you're gonna notice the ACR engage, which is the automatic compression release. So the exhaust valve is gonna move ever so slightly, you see that? So it just opens ever so slightly on the compression stroke and then we go back around and we're back to the exhaust stroke. So the push rods are working and the valves are moving which is good. So what I'm going to do now is just use a piece of wooden dowel and I'm going to go into the cylinder. I'm going to put it at top dead center and I'm just going to check to make sure that we have the proper valve lash here just so that I cover all my bases. And then if that doesn't alert me to anything, then I can go ahead and do a compression check because that's pretty much everything. And the compression check will be the last thing that I could do. So using my dowel, once we were past the intake stroke, I knew we were at the compression stroke. So I'm now at top dead center of the compression stroke. You can see right there, there's my magnet and it's just past the last coil terminal, which means that this engine fires right before the piston is at top dead center, which is normal. It, I think it's about what, seven degrees before top dead center, I'm assuming. So I'm just gonna go ahead and check the valve lash right now. And then just to cover that base, I can go ahead and put my valve cover back on because it's not a case of like, let's say a stuck valve 
or let's say a bent push rod because sometimes when you go to use the brute force method to unseason engine what will happen is you could bend a push rod because they're just aluminum so this is just a video of me going through a diagnostic process which is just one by one eliminating possible things that could be preventing this engine from starting so at top dead center on the compression stroke when i go in and i try to measure the valve lash of the exhaust stroke it's about three to three and a half thousandths of an inch now coming over to the intake side check this out i'm trying to get a three thousandth of an inch feeler gauge in here and it's just not going so i think what's happened here is someone's adjusted these valves improperly Okay, so now that I've set my valves to the proper spec, four thousandth of an inch on the intake and I believe six thousandths of an inch on the exhaust, basically what I'm going to be using is my cylinder leak down tester here. I've used that in a video where I did, I believe it was an SV540 Kohler engine. If you want to watch that video, I'll link it in the top right of your screen. Basically, I have this line coming from my compressor and it goes into a gauge. As I rotate this gauge, it's going to put a positive pressure into my cylinder. And basically, we're gonna fill it up to approximately 40 PSI here. And on this side, you can see we have less than 20. So that's more than a 50% loss in compression. Now, you're only supposed to have about 10%. So what does that mean? Well, currently the piston is set at top dead center on the compression stroke, which means that both valves are closed. We're not leaking air out of our exhaust port, and we're not leaking air out of our intake port. Now, if you wanna hear what an intake valve leak would sound like, this is what it'll sound like. I got the pressure lowered to about 15, 20 PSI, and I'm just gonna push on the valve here. So that's an intake valve leak. Now here's an exhaust valve leak. Hear that? So there's a difference. We're leaking air from our crankcase vent. Now on this particular model, there is a crankcase vent right there. And you guys will probably be able to hear the air. So that's our crankcase vent. It follows down this little valley here, follows along the cylinder head, and then goes back into your crankcase. Now the only way that the air coming from our compressor can get into the cylinder head right now is if it goes past the piston rings, into the bottom end, and then through the crankcase vent up into the cylinder head. Now normally you have a crankcase vent tube that comes from the actual bottom end of the crankcase, and then that will go into either your carburetor or your air box. And that is just simply for emissions so that it burns off a little bit of that extra gas that comes out of your crankcase. On this model of engine, however, they have that crankcase vent going all the way into the cylinder head. So it vents directly into the overhead valve compartment, which is right here. And that's exactly where we're leaking air from. So using a piece of dowel to just show you guys, hear the noise changing. So if you'll remember at the beginning of the video, I said that my customer bought this brand new two years ago, and he said to me that he only used it for about an hour and a half since then, and it sat for a long time in between. He went to start it this year, and the engine was seized. When he went to use the electric starter, it would not turn over the engine, and when he went to pull the pull start, it would not turn over either. So he removed the recoil, same as I have, but what he did was he took a breaker bar to the nut on the flywheel. And like I said, he used the brute force method to break the engine free. Now you're not supposed to do that. If anything, you wanna pull your spark plug, flip the engine up, and then pour some automatic transmission fluid in there. And that'll help lubricate the piston rings. That'll help them unseize themselves from the cylinder walls. So what he did was broke it free. And in the process, I'm assuming, because this is my best guess here, he cracked the piston rings. So the piston rings are no longer making a tight seal between the piston and the cylinder walls. And that right there will cause the air from our gauge here to go past the piston rings into the bottom end and then back up through the crankcase tube vent. The only other thing that could cause that is a cracked piston but I have some pictures here that I can show you when I went to put my USB endoscope in there and the piston looks okay. The little scoring at the very center of the piston is just from my wooden dowel that I put in there to gauge where my piston was in regards to setting it to top dead center to adjust the valves. So apart from that, the piston looks to be in okay condition. I can't see any cracks or you know massive holes in it. 
So where do we go from here? How do we fix this issue? Well, you want new piston rings. To do that, I would have to drain the oil, remove the engine, and then pull the cylinder head, pull the bottom end, and then go ahead and pull the connecting rod, remove the connecting rod with the piston, and then go ahead and remove the piston itself so that I can go ahead and inspect the piston rings. That's literally the only way I can go ahead and do that. But at the end of the day, if my customer wants me to do that, I cannot give him a guarantee. And if this was a name brand Honda, Briggs & Stratton, Tecumseh engine, I would 100% guarantee my work as I've always done in the past. But when I'm working on China engines, so this is again, a 420 CC power fist engine, these things are garbage, guys. Not to mention that the valves were adjusted too tight and the spark plug gap was way off. So this thing, you know, has major issues. Not to mention that because it sat so long, it may need a carb clean as well. I see a bunch of rust in there. So this thing could have gotten some water in it at one point. Maybe there was a little bit of rust around the rings. I don't know, but I can guarantee you that when he put this away, he didn't fog the cylinder, which meant that there was absolutely no lubrication in there to lubricate the piston rings. So the engine does have to come apart, but because the engine doesn't run, I haven't been able to test the pump. So there could be an issue with the pump as well, considering it sat so long. If he didn't drain out the water, then there's probably some calcium buildups in there. And it's quite possible that a couple valves in there could be seized up. So I'm going to relay this information back to my customer and then I will let him choose what he wants to do, whether he wants me to fix it or whether he wants me to source a new engine because I should be able to repower, which is essentially just throw a different kind of engine with the same crankshaft diameter and length onto that frame and then he'll have a functional 5,000 PSI pressure washer but at the end of the day, it's up to his discretion. So if he wants me to fix it, I may do a video on it, but these engines are garbage, guys. I don't recommend using them at all. And if you're looking to buy an engine and you don't wanna spend a lot of money, then these are the possible issues that you could run into. So just keep that in mind. You pay a little bit more money, you get a little bit more quality. But that's it for today's video. If you guys enjoyed the video, think about leaving me a thumbs up. You can click over here to subscribe and click over here to watch one of my previous videos. I upload every single week. So be sure to stop on by next week, check the channel out for new content. And as always guys, thanks for watching.